Chapter Five of the Life Everlasting by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Unexpected Meeting To spend a few days on board a yacht with the same companions is a very good test of the value of sympathetic vibration in human associations. I found it so. I might as well have been quite alone on the Diana as with Morton Harland and his daughter, though they were always uniformly kind to me and thoughtful of my comfort. But between us there was a great gulf fixed, though every now and again Catherine Harland made feeble and pathetic efforts to cross that gulf and reach me where I stood on the other side. But her strength was not equal to the task, her will-power was sapped at its root, and every day she allowed herself to become more and more pliantly the prey of Dr. Braille, who, with a subconscious feeling that I knew him to be a mere medical charlatan, had naturally warned her against me as an imaginative theorist, without any foundation of belief in my own theories. I therefore shut myself within a fortress of reserve, and declined to discuss any point of either religion or science with those for whom the one was a farce and the other mere materialism. At all times, when we were together, I kept the conversation deliberately down to commonplaces which were safe, if dull, and it amused me not a little to see that at this course of action on my part Mr. Harland was first surprised, then disappointed, and finally bored. And I was glad. That I should bore him as much as he bored me was the happy consummation of my immediate desires. I talked as all conventional women talk, of the weather, of our minimum and maximum speed, of the newspaper sensations and vulgarities that were served up to us whenever we called at a port for the mails of the fish that frequented such and such waters, of sport, of this and that millionaire whose highland castle or shooting box was crammed with the elite, whose delight is to kill innocent birds and animals, of the latest fool flyers and aeroplanes, in short, no fashionable jabberer of social inanities could have beaten me in what average persons call common sense talk talk which resulted after a while in the usual vagueness of attention accompanied by smothered yawning. I was resolved not to lift the line of thought up in the air in the manner whereof I had often been accused, but to keep it level with the ground, so that when we left Tobermory, where we had anchored for a couple of days, the limits of the yacht were becoming rather cramped and narrow for our differing minds and a monotony was beginning to set in that threatened to be dangerous, if not unbearable. As the Diana steamed along through the drowsy, misty light of the summer afternoon, past the jagged coast of the mainland, I sat quite by myself on deck, watching the creeping purple haze that partially veiled the mountains of Ardna Merchan and Moidart, and I began to wonder whether, after all, it might not be better to write to my friend Francesca and tell her that her prophecies had already come true, that I was beginning to be weary of a holiday passed in an atmosphere bereft of all joyousness, and that she must expect me in Invernessshire at once. And yet I was reluctant to end my trip with the Harlands too soon. There was a secret wish in my heart which I hardly breathed to myself a wish that I might again see the strange vessel that had appeared and disappeared so suddenly, and make the acquaintance of its owner. It would surely be an interesting break in the present condition of things, to say the least of it. I did not know then, though I know now, why my mind so persistently busied itself with the fancied personality of the unknown possessor of the mysterious craft, which, as Captain Derrick said, sailed without wind. But I found myself always thinking about him, 
and trying to picture his face and form. I took myself sharply to task for what I considered a foolish mental attitude, but do what I would, the attitude remained unchanged. It was helped, perhaps, in a trifling way, by the apparently fadeless quality of the pink bell heather, which had been given me by the weird-looking highland fellow who called himself Jamie. For though three or four days had now passed since I first wore it, it showed no signs of withering. As a rule, the delicate waxen bells of this plant turn yellow a few hours after they are plucked, but my little bunch was as brilliantly fresh as ever. I kept it in a glass without water on the table in my sitting room, and it looked always the same. I was questioning myself as to what I should really do if my surroundings remained as hopelessly inert and uninteresting as they were at present. Go on with a Diana for a while longer on the chance of seeing the strange yacht again? Or make up my mind to get put out at some point from which I could reach Inverness easily, when Mr. Harland came up suddenly behind my chair and laid his hand on my shoulder. Are you in dreamland? he inquired, and I thought his voice sounded rather weak and dispirited. There's a wonderful light on those hills just now. I raised my eyes and saw the purple shadows being cloven and scattered one after another by long rays of late sunshine that poured like golden wine through the dividing wreaths of vapor. Above, the sky was pure turquoise blue, melting into pale opal and emerald near the line of the gray sea which showed little flecks of white foam under the freshening breeze. Bringing my gaze down from the dazzling radiance of the heavens, I turned toward Mr. Harland and was startled and shocked to see the drawn and livid pallor of his face and the anguish of his expression. "'You are ill!' I exclaimed, and springing up in haste I offered him my chair. "'Do sit down!' He made a mute gesture of denial, and with slow difficulty drew another chair up beside mine and dropped into it with an air of heavy weariness. "'I am not ill now,' he said. "'A little while ago I was very ill. I was in pain, horrible pain. Braille did what he could for me. It was not much. He says I must expect to suffer now and again, until... until the end.' Impulsively I laid my hand on his. "'I am very sorry,' I said gently. I wish I could be of some use to you. He looked at me with a curious wistfulness. You could, no doubt, if I believed as you do, he replied, and then was silent for a moment. Presently he spoke again. Do you know, I am rather disappointed in you. Are you? And I smiled a little. Why? He did not answer at once. He seemed absorbed in troubled musings. When he resumed, it was in a low, meditative tone, almost as if he were speaking to himself. When I first met you, you remember, at one of those social crushes which make the London season so infinitely tedious, I was told you were gifted with unusual psychic power, and that you had in yourself the secret of an abounding, exhaustless vitality. I repeat the words an abounding, exhaustless vitality. This interested me, because I know that our modern men and women are mostly only half alive. I heard of you that it did people good to be in your company, that your influence upon them was remarkable, and that there was some unknown form of occult or psychic science to which you had devoted years of study, with the result that you stood, as it were, apart from the world though in the world. This, I say, is what I heard. But you did not believe it, I interposed. Why do you say that? he asked quickly. Because I know you could not believe it, I answered. It would be impossible for you. A gleam of satire flashed in his sunken eyes. Well, you are right there. I did not believe it, but I expected. I know, and I laughed. You expected what is called a singular woman, one who makes herself singular, adopts a singular pose, 
and is altogether removed from ordinary humanity. And of course you are disappointed. I am not at all a type of the veiled priestess. It is not that, he said, with a little vexation. When I saw you, I recognized you to be a very transparent creature, devoted to innocent dreams which are not life but that secret which you are reported to possess, the secret of wonderful, abounding, exhaustless vitality, how does it happen that you have it? I myself see that force expressed in your very glance and gesture, and what puzzles me is that it is not an animal vitality, it is something else. I was silent. You have not a robust physique, he went on, yet you are more full of the spirit of life than men and women twice as strong as you are. You are a feminine thing, too, and that goes against you. But one can see in you a worker. You evidently enjoy the exercise of the accomplishments you possess, and nothing comes amiss to you. I wonder how you manage it. When you joined us on this trip a few days ago, you brought a kind of atmosphere with you that was almost buoyant, and now I am disappointed, because you seem to have enclosed yourself within it, and to have left us out. Have you not left yourselves out? I queried gently. I, personally, have really nothing to do with it. Just remember that when we have talked on any subject above the line of the general and commonplace, your sole object has been to draw me for the amusement of yourself and Dr. Braille. Ah, you saw that, did you? he interrupted, with a faint smile. Naturally. Had you believed half you say you were told of me, you would have known I must have seen it. Can you wonder that I refuse to be drawn? He looked at me with an odd expression of mingled surprise and annoyance, and I met his gaze fully and frankly. His eyes shifted uneasily away from mine. One may feel a pardonable curiosity, he said, and a desire to know. To know what? I asked, with some warmth. How can you obtain what you are secretly craving for, if you persist in denying what is true? You are afraid of death, yet you invite it by ignoring the source of life. The curtain is down, you are outside eternal realities altogether, in a chaos of your own voluntary creation. I spoke with some passion, and he heard me patiently. Let us try to understand each other, he said, after a pause, though it will be difficult. You speak of eternal realities. To me there are none, save the constant scattering and reuniting of atoms. These, so far as we know of the extraordinary, and to me quite unintelligent, plan of the universe, are forever shifting and changing into various forms and clusters of forms, such as solar systems, planets, comets, stardust, and the like. Our present view of them is chiefly based on the researches of Larmor and Thompson of Cambridge. From them and the other scientists, we learn that electricity exists in small particles, which we can in a manner see in the cathode rays and these particles are called electrons. These compose atoms of matter. Well, there are a trillion of atoms in each granule of dust, while electrons are so much smaller that a hundred thousand of them can lie in the diameter of an atom. I know all this, but I do not know why the atoms or electrons should exist at all, nor what cause there should be for their constant an often violent state of movement. They apparently always have been, and always will be. Therefore, they are all that can be called eternal realities. Sir Norman Lockyer tells us that the matter of the universe is undergoing a continuous process of evolution. But even if it is so, what is that to me individually? It neither helps nor consoles me for being one infinitesimal spark in the general conflagration. Now you believe in the force that is behind your system of electrons and atoms, I said. 
for by whatever means or substances the universe is composed a mighty intelligence governs it and i look to the cause more than the effect for even i am a part of the whole i belong to the source of the stream as much as to the stream itself an abstract lifeless principle without will or intention or intelligence could not have evolved the splendors of nature or the intellectual capabilities of man it could not have given rise to what was not in itself he fixed his eyes steadily upon me that last sentence is sound argument he said as though reluctantly admitting the obvious and i suppose i am to presume that itself is the wellspring from which you draw or imagine you draw your psychic force if i have any psychic force at all i responded where do you suppose it should come from but that which gives vitality to all animate nature i cannot understand why you blind yourself to the open and visible fact of a divine intelligence working in and through all things if you could but acknowledge it and set yourself in tune with it you would find life a new and far more dominant joy than it is to you now i firmly believe that your very illness has arisen from your determined attitude of unbelief that's what a christian scientist would say he answered with a touch of scorn i begin to think dr braille is right in his estimate of you i held my peace have you no curiosity he demanded don't you want to know his opinion no and i smiled my dear mr harland with all your experience of the world has it never occurred to you that there are some people whose opinions don't matter braille is a clever man he said somewhat testily and you are merely an imaginative woman then why do you trouble about me i asked him quickly why do you want to find out that something in me which baffles both dr braille and yourself it was now his turn to be silent and he remained so for some time his eyes fixed on the shadowing heavens the waves were roughening slightly and a swell from the atlantic lifted the diana curtsying over their foam-flecked crests as she ploughed her way swiftly along presently he turned to me with a smile let us strike a truce he said i promise not to try and draw you any more but please do not isolate yourself from us try to feel that we are your friends i want you to enjoy this trip if possible but i fear that we are proving rather dull company for you we are making for sky at good speed and shall probably anchor in loch scavig tonight Tomorrow we might land and do the excursion to Loch Korisk if you care for that, though Catherine is not a good walker. I felt rather remorseful as he said these words in a kindly tone. Yet I knew very well that, notwithstanding all the strenuous efforts which might be made by the rules of conventional courtesy, it would be impossible for me to feel quite at home in the surroundings which he had created for himself i inwardly resolved however to make the best of it and to try and steer clear of any possibilities or incidents which might tend to draw the line of demarcation too strongly between us some instinct told me that present conditions were not to remain as they were so i answered my host gently and assured him of my entire willingness to fall in with any of his plans our conversation then gradually drifted into ordinary topics till towards sunset when i went down to my cabin to dress for dinner i had a fancy to wear the bunch of pink bell heather that still kept its fresh and waxen looking delicacy of bloom and this fastened in the lace of my white gown was my only adornment that night there was a distinct attempt on everybody's part to make things sociable and pleasant catherine harland was for once quite cheerful and chatty and proposed that as there was a lovely moonlight we should all go after dinner into the deck saloon where there was a piano and that i should sing for them i was rather surprised at this suggestion as she was not fond of music nevertheless 
there had been such an evident wish shown by her and her father to lighten the monotony which had been creeping like a mental fog over us all that i readily agreed to anything which might perhaps for the moment give them pleasure we went up on deck accordingly and on arriving there were all smitten into awed silence by the wonderful beauty of the scene we were anchored in loch skavig and the light of the moon fell with a weird splendour on the gloom of the surrounding hills a pale beam touching the summits here and there and deepening the solemn effect of the lake and the magnificent forms of its sentinel mountains a low murmur of hidden streams sounded on the deep stillness and enhanced the fascination of the surrounding landscape which was more like the landscape of a dream than a reality the deep breaths of the dense darkness lying lost among the cavernous slopes of the hills were broken at intervals by strange rifts of light arising as it were from the palpitating water which now and again showed gleams of pale emerald and gold phosphorescence the stars looked large and white like straying bits of the moon and the mysterious swishing of slow ripples heaving against the sides of the yacht suggested the whisperings of uncanny spirits we stood in a silent group entranced by the grandeur of the night and by our own loneliness in the midst of it for there was no sign of a fisherman's hut or boat moored to the shore or anything which could give us a sense of human companionship a curious feeling of disappointment suddenly came over me i lifted my eyes to the vast dark sky with a kind of mute appeal and moon and stars appeared to float up there like ships in a deep sea i had expected something more in this strange almost spectral looking landscape and yet i knew not why i should expect anything beautiful as the whole scene was and fully as i recognized its beauty an overpowering depression suddenly gripped me as with a cold hand there was a dreary emptiness in this majestic solitude that seemed to crush my spirit utterly i moved a little away from my companions and leaned over the deck rail looking far into the black shadows of the shore defined more deeply by the contrasting brilliance of the moon and my thoughts flew with undesired swiftness to the darkest line of life's horizon i had for the moment lost the sense of joy how wretched all we human creatures are i said to my inner self what hope after all is there for us imprisoned in a world which has no pity for us whatever may be our fate a world that goes on in precisely the same fashion whether we live or die work or are idle these tragic hills this cold lake this white moon were the same when caesar lived and would still be the same when we who gazed upon them now were all gone into the unknown it seemed difficult to try and realize this obvious fact so difficult as to be almost unnatural supposing that any towns or villages had existed on this desolate shore they had proved useless against the devouring forces of nature just as the splendid buried cities of south america had proved useless in all their magnificence useless as the golden age of lenca in ceylon more than two thousand years ago of what avail then is the struggle of human life is it for the many or only for the few is all the toil and sorrow of millions merely for the uplifting and perfecting of certain individual types and is this what christ meant when he said many are called but few are chosen if so why such waste of brain and heart and love and patience tears came suddenly into my eyes and i started as from a bad dream when dr braille approached me softly from behind i am sorry to disturb your reverie he said but miss harland has gone into the deck saloon and we are all waiting to hear you sing i looked up at him i don't feel as if i could sing tonight 
I replied, rather tremulously. This lonely landscape depresses me. He saw that my eyes were wet and smiled. You are overwrought, he said. Your own theories of health and vitality are not infallible. You must be taken care of. You think too much. Or too little, I suggested. Really, my dear lady, you cannot possibly think too little where health and happiness are concerned. The sanest and most comfortable people on earth are those who eat well and never think at all. An empty brain and a full stomach make the sum total of a contented life. So you imagine, I said, with a slight gesture of veiled contempt. So I know, he answered with emphasis, and I have had a wide experience. Now don't look daggers at me. Come and sing. He offered me his arm, but I put it aside and walked by myself toward the deck saloon. Mr. Harland and Catherine were seated there, with all the lights turned full on, so that the radiance of the moon through the window was completely eclipsed. The piano was open. As I came in, Catherine looked at me with a surprised air. "'Why, how pale you are!' she exclaimed. "'One would think you had seen a ghost!' I laughed. "'Perhaps I have. Loch Scavig is sufficient setting for any amount of ghosts. It's such a lovely place.' and a slight tremor ran through me as I played a few soft chords. "'What shall I sing to you?' "'Something of the country we are in,' said Mr. Harland. "'Don't you know any of those old, wild, Gaelic airs?' I thought a moment, and then, to a low, rippling accompaniment, I sang the old Celtic fairy's love song. "'Why should I sit and sigh, pulling bracken, pulling bracken, why should I sit and sigh, on the hillside dreary, when I see the plover rising, or the curlew wheeling, then I know my mortal lover back to me is stealing. When the day wears away, sad, I look adown the valley, every sound heard around sets my heart a-thrilling. Why should I sit and sigh, pulling bracken, pulling bracken, why should I sit and sigh, all alone and weary? Ah! but there is something wanting. Oh, but I am weary. Come, my true and tender lover, o'er the hills to cheer me. Why should I sit and sigh? Pulling bracken, pulling bracken, why should I sit and sigh, all alone and weary? I had scarcely finished the last verse, when Captain Derrick suddenly appeared at the door of the saloon in a great state of excitement. Come out, Mr. Harland, he almost shouted. Come quickly, all of you. There's that strange yacht again. I rose from my seat at the piano, trembling a little. At last, I thought, at last. My heart was beating tumultuously, though I could not explain my own emotion to myself. In another moment, we were all standing speechless and amazed, gazing at surely the most wonderful sight that had ever been seen by human eyes. There, on the dark and lonely waters of Loch Scavig, was poised, rather than anchored, the fairy vessel of my dreams, with all sails spread, sails that were white as milk and seemingly drenched with a sparkling, dewy radiance, for they scintillated like hoarfrost in the sun, and glittered against the sombre background of the mountainous shore with an almost blinding splendor. Our whole crew of sailors and servants on the Diana came together in astonished groups, whispering among themselves, all evidently more or less scared by the strange spectacle. Captain Derrick waited for someone to hazard a remark. Then, as we remained silent, he addressed Mr. Harland. Well, sir, what do you make of it? Mr. Harland did not answer for a man who professed indifference to all events and circumstances. He seemed startled for once, and a little afraid. Catherine caught me by the arm. She was shivering nervously. "'Do you think it is a real yacht?' she whispered. I was amused at this question, coming as it did from a woman who denied the supernatural. "'Of course it is,' I answered. "'Don't you see people moving about on board?' 
for in the brilliant light shed by those extraordinary sails the schooner appeared to be fully manned several of the crew were busy on her deck and there was nothing of the phantom in their movements her sails must surely be lit up in that way by electricity said dr brayle who had been watching her attentively but how it is done and why is rather puzzling i never saw anything quite to resemble it she came into the lock like a flash said captain derrick i saw her slide in round the point and then without a sound of any kind there she was safe anchored before you could whistle she behaved in just the same way when we first sighted her off mo i listened to what they were saying impatiently wondering what would be the end of their surmises and speculations why not exchange courtesies i said suddenly here we are two yachts anchored near each other in a lonely lake why should we not know each other then all the mysteries you are talking about would be cleared up quite true said mr harland breaking his silence at last but isn't it rather late to pay a call what time is it about half past ten answered dr brayle glancing at his watch oh let us get to bed murmured miss catherine pleadingly what's the good of making any enquiries to-night well if you don't make them to-night ten to one you won't have the chance to-morrow said captain derrick bluntly that yacht will repeat her former manoeuvres and vanish at sunrise as all spectres are traditionally supposed to do said dr brayle lighting a cigarette as he spoke and beginning to smoke it with a careless air i vote for catching the ghost before it melts away into the morning while this talk went on mr harland stepped back into the saloon and wrote a note which he enclosed in a sealed envelope with this in his hand he came out to us again captain will you get the boat lowered please he said then as captain derrick hastened to obey this order he turned to his secretary mr swinton i want you to take this note to the owner of that yacht whoever he may be with my compliments don't give it to anyone else but himself mr swinton looking very pale and uncomfortable took the note gingerly between his fingers himself yes he stammered and uh if there should be no one what do you mean and mr harlan frowned in his own particularly unpleasant way there's sure to be some one even if he were the devil you can say to him that the ladies of our party are very much interested in the beautiful illumination of his yacht and that we'll be glad to see him on board ours if he cares to come be as polite as you can and as agreeable as you like it has not occurred to you i suppose you have not thought that that it may be an illusion faltered mr swinton uneasily glancing at the glistening sails that shamed the silver sheen of the moon a sort of mirage in the atmosphere mr harland gave vent to a laugh the heartiest i had ever heard from him upon my word swinton he exclaimed i should never have thought you capable of nerves come come be off with you the boat is lowered all's ready thus commanded there was nothing for the reluctant mr swinton but to obey and i could not help smiling at his evident discomfiture all his precise and matter-of-fact self-satisfaction was gone in a moment he was nothing but a very timorous creature afraid to examine into what he could not at once understand no such terrors however were displayed by the sailors who undertook to row him over to the yacht they as well as their captain were anxious to discover the mystery if mystery there was and we all by one instinct pressed to the gangway as he descended the companion ladder and entered the boat which glided away immediately with a low and rhythmical plash of oars we could watch it as it drew nearer and nearer the illuminated vessel and our excitement grew more and more intense for once mr harland and his daughter had forgotten all about themselves and catherine's customary miserable expression of face 
had altogether disappeared in the keenness of her interest for something more immediately thrilling than her own ailments so far as i was concerned i could hardly endure the suspense that seemed to weigh on every nerve of my body during the few minutes interval that elapsed between the departure of the boat and its drawing up alongside the strange yacht my thoughts were all in a whirl i felt as if something unprecedented and almost terrifying was about to happen but i could not reason out the cause of my mental agitation there they go said mr harland they're alongside see those fellows are lowering the companion ladder there's nothing supernatural about them swinton's all right look he's on board we strained our eyes through the brilliant flare shed by the illuminated sails on the darkness and could see mr swinton talking to a group of sailors one of them went away but returned almost immediately followed by a man clad in white yachting flannels who standing near one of the shining sails caught some of the light on his own figure with undeniably becoming effect i was the first to perceive him and as i looked the impression came upon me that he was no stranger i had seen him often before this sudden consciousness swiftly borne in upon me calmed all the previous tumult of my mind and i was no longer anxious as to the result of our possible acquaintance catherine harland pressed my arm excitedly there he is she said that must be the owner of the yacht he's reading father's letter he was we could see the little sheet of paper turning over in his hands and while we waited wondering what would be his answer the light on the sails of his vessel began to pale and die away beam after beam of radiance slipped off as it were like drops of water and before we could quite realize it there was darkness where all had lately been so bright and the canvas was hauled down with the quenching of that intense brilliancy we lost sight of the human figures on deck and could not imagine what was to happen next the dark shore looked darker than ever the outline of the yacht was now truly spectral like a ship of black cobweb against the moon and we looked questioningly at each other in silence then mr harland spoke in a low tone the boat is coming back he said i hear the oars i leaned over the side of our vessel and tried to see through the gloom how still the water was not a ripple disturbed its surface but there were strange gleams of wandering light in its depths like dropped jewels lost on sands far below the regular dip of oars sounded nearer and nearer my heart was beating with painful quickness I could not understand the strange feeling that overpowered me. I felt as if my very soul were going out of my body to meet that oncoming boat which was cleaving its way through the darkness. Another brief interval, and then we saw it shoot out into a patch of moonlight. We could perceive Mr. Swinton seated in the stern, with another figure beside him, that of a man who stood up as he neared our yacht and lifted his cap with an easy gesture of salutation and then as the boat came alongside caught at the guide rope and sprang lightly on to the first step of the companion ladder why he's actually come over to us himself ejaculated mr harland and he hurried to the gangway just in time to receive the visitor as he stepped on deck well harland how are you said a mellow voice in the cheeriest of accents it's strange we should meet like this after so many years end of chapter five chapter six of the life everlasting by marie corelli this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recognition At these words, and at sight of the speaker, Morton Harland started back as if he had been shot. Santorus? 
he exclaimed. Not possible. Raphael Santoris? No, you must be his son. The stranger laughed. My good Harland, always the skeptic. Miracles are many, but there is one which is beyond all performance. A man cannot be his own offspring. I am that very Santoris who you saw last in Oxford. Come, come, you ought to know me. He stepped more fully into the light which was shed from the open door of the deck saloon, and which showed himself to be a man of distinguished appearance, apparently about forty years of age. He was well built, with the straight back and broad shoulders of an athlete. His face was finely featured and radiant with the glow of health and strength, and as he smiled and laid one hand on Mr. Harland's shoulder, he looked the very embodiment of active, powerful manhood. Morton Harland stared at him in amazement and something of terror. Raphael Santoris, he repeated. You are his living image, but you cannot be himself. You are too young. A gleam of amusement sparkled in the stranger's eyes. Don't let us talk of age or youth for the moment, he said. Here I am, your eccentric college acquaintance whom you and several other fellows fought shy of years ago. I assure you, I am quite harmless. Will you present me to the ladies? There was a brief embarrassed pause. Then Mr. Harland turned to us where we had withdrawn ourselves a little apart and addressed his daughter. Catherine, he said, this gentleman tells me he knew me at Oxford, and if he is right, I also knew him. I spoke of him only the other night at dinner, you remember, but I did not tell you his name. It is Raphael Santoris, if indeed he is Santoris, though my Santoris should be a much older man. I extremely regret, said our visitor then, advancing and bowing courteously to Catherine and myself, that I do not fulfill the required conditions of age. Will you try to forgive me? He smiled, and we were a little confused, hardly knowing what to say. Involuntarily I raised my eyes to his, and with one glance saw in those clear blue orbs that so steadfastly met mine a world of memories, memories tender, wistful, and pathetic, entangled as in tears and fire. All the inward instincts of my spirit told me that I knew him well, as well as one knows the gold of sunshine or the color of the sky. Yet where had I seen him often, and often before? While my thoughts puzzled over this question, he averted his gaze from mine and went on speaking to Catherine. I understand, he said, that you are interested in the lighting of my yacht. It is most beautiful and wonderful, answered Catherine, in her coldest tone of conventional politeness, and so unusual. His eyebrows went up with a slightly quizzical air. Yes, I suppose it is unusual, he said. I am always forgetting that what is not quite common seems strange. But really the arrangement is very simple. The yacht is called the Dream, and she is, as her name implies, a dream fulfilled. Her sails are her only motive power. They are charged with electricity, and that is why they shine at night in a way that must seem to outsiders like a special illumination. If you will honor me with a visit tomorrow, I will show you how it is managed. Here, Captain Derrick, who had been standing close by, was unable to resist the impulse of his curiosity. Excuse me, sir, he said suddenly. But may I ask how it is you sail without wind? Certainly, you may ask and be answered, Santoris replied. As I have just said, our sails are our only motive power, but we do not need the wind to fill them. By a very simple scientific method, or rather, let me say, by a scientific application of natural means, we generate a form of electric force from the air and water as we move. This force fills the sails and propels the vessel with amazing swiftness wherever she is steered. Neither calm nor storm affects her progress. 
when there is a good gale blowing our way we naturally lessen the draft on our own supplies but we can make excellent speed even in the teeth of a contrary wind we escape all the inconveniences of steam and smoke and dirt and noise and i dare say in about a couple of hundred years or so my method of sailing the seas will be applied to all ships large and small with much wonder that it was not thought of long ago why not apply it yourself asked dr brayle now joining in the conversation for the first time and putting the question with an air of incredulous amusement with such a marvellous discovery if it is yours you should make your fortune santoris glanced him over with polite tolerance it is possible i do not need to make it he answered then turning again to captain derrick he said kindly i hope the matter seems clearer to you we sail without wind it is true but not without the power that creates wind the captain shook his head perplexedly well sir i can't quite take it in he confessed i'd like to know more so you shall harland will you all come over to the yacht to-morrow there may be some excursion we could do together and you might remain and dine with me afterwards mr harland's face was a study doubt and fear struggled for the mastery in his expression and he did not at once answer then he seemed to conquer his hesitation and to recover himself give me a moment with you alone he said with a gesture of invitation towards the deck saloon our visitor readily complied with this suggestion and the two men entered the saloon together and closed the door silence followed catherine looked at me in questioning bewilderment then she called to mr swinton who had been standing about as though awaiting orders in his usual tiresome and servile way what sort of an interview did you have with that gentleman when you got on board his yacht she asked very pleasant very pleasant indeed he replied the vessel is magnificently appointed i have never seen such luxury extraordinary more than princely mr santoris himself i found particularly agreeable when he had read mr harland's note he said he was glad to find it was from an old college companion and that he would come over with me to renew the acquaintance as he has done you were not afraid of him then queried dr brayle sarcastically oh dear no he seems quite well bred and i should say he must be very wealthy a most powerful recommendation murmured brayle the best in the world what do you think of him he asked turning suddenly to me i have no opinion i answered quietly how could i say otherwise how could i tell such a man as he was of one who had entered my life as insistently as a flash of light illumining all that had hitherto been dark at that moment catherine caught my hand listen she whispered a window of the deck saloon was open and we stood near it dr brayle and mr swinton had moved away to light fresh cigars and we two women were for the moment alone we heard mr harland's voice raised to a sort of smothered cry my god you are santoris of course i am and the deep answering tones were full of music the music of a grave and infinitely tender compassion why did you doubt it and why call upon god that is a name which has no meaning for you there followed a silence i looked at catherine and saw her pale face in the light of the moon haggard in line and older than her years and my heart was full of pity for her she was excited beyond her usual self i could see that the appearance of the stranger from the yacht had aroused her interest and compelled her admiration i tried to draw her gently to a farther distance from the saloon but she would not move we ought not to listen i said catherine come away she shook her head hush she softly breathed i want to hear just then mr harland spoke again i am sorry he said i have wronged you and i apologize but you can hardly wonder at my disbelief 
considering your appearance, which is that of a much younger man than your actual years should make you. The rich voice of Santoris gave answer. Did I not tell you and others long ago that for me there is no such thing as time, but only eternity? The soul is always young, and I live in the spirit of youth, not in the matter of age. Catherine turned her eyes upon me in wide open amazement. He must be mad, she said. I made no reply, either by word or look. We heard Mr. Harland talking, but in a lower tone and we could not distinguish what he said. Presently, Santoris answered, and his vibrant tones were clear and distinct. Why should it seem to you so wonderful? He said. You do not think it miraculous when the sculptor, standing before a shapeless block of marble, hews it out to conformity with his inward thought. The marble is mere marble, hard to deal with, difficult to shape. Yet out of its resisting roughness, the thinker and worker can mould an Apollo or a Psyche. You find nothing marvellous in this, though the result of its shaping is due to nothing but thought and labour. Yet, when you see the human body, which is far easier to shape than marble, brought into submission by the same forces of thought and labour, you are astonished. Surely it is a simple matter to control the living cells of one's own fleshly organization, and compel them to do the bidding of the dominating spirit, than to chisel the semblance of a god out of a block of stone. There was a pause after this. Then followed more inaudible talk on the part of Mr. Harland, and while we yet waited to gather further fragments of the conversation, he suddenly threw open the saloon door and called to us to come in. We at once obeyed the summons, and as we entered, he said in a somewhat excited, nervous way, I must apologize before you ladies for the rather doubting manner in which I received my former college friend. He is Raphael Santoris. I ought to have known that there's only one of his type. But the curious part of it is that he should be nearly as old as I am yet somehow he is not. I laughed. It would have been hard not to laugh, for the mere idea of comparing the two men, Santoris in such splendid prime, and Morton Harland in his bent, lean, and wizened condition, as being of the same or nearly the same age, was quite ludicrous. Even Catherine smiled, a weak and timorous smile. I suppose you have grown old more quickly, father, she said. Perhaps Mr. Santoris has not lived at such high pressure. Santoris, standing by the saloon center table under the full blaze of the electric lamp, looked at her with a kindly interest. High or low, I live each moment of my days to the full, Miss Harland, he said. I do not drowse it or kill it, I live it. This lady and he turned his eyes towards me. Looks as if she did the same. She does, said Mr. Harland quickly, and with emphasis. That's quite true. You were always a good reader of character, Santoris. I believe I have not introduced you properly to our little friend. Here he presented me by name, and I held out my hand. Santoris took it in his own with a light, warm clasp, gently releasing it again as he bowed. I call her our little friend, because she brings such an atmosphere of joy along with her wherever she goes. We persuaded her to come with us yachting this summer for a very selfish reason, because we are disposed to be dull and she is always bright. The advantage, you see, is all on our side. Oddly enough, I was talking to her about you the other night, the very night, by the by, that your yacht came behind us off Mull. That was rather a curious coincidence when you come to think of it. Not curious at all, said Santoris, but perfectly natural. When will you realize that there is no such thing as coincidence, but only a very exact system of mathematics? Mr. Harland gave a slight, incredulous gesture. Your theories again, he said. You hold to them still, but our little friend is likely to agree with you. 
when i was speaking of you to her i told her she had somewhat the same ideas as yourself she is a sort of psychist whatever that may mean do you not know queried santoris with a grave smile it is easy to guess by merely looking at her my cheeks grew warm and my eyes fell beneath his steadfast gaze i wondered whether mr harland or catherine would notice that in his coat he wore a small bunch of the same kind of bright pink bell heather which was my only jewel of adorning that night the ice of introductory recognition being broken we gathered round the saloon table and sat down while the steward brought wine and other refreshments to offer to our guest mr harland's former uneasiness and embarrassment seemed now at an end and he gave himself up to the pleasure of renewing association with one who had known him as a young man and they began talking easily together of their days at college of the men they had both been acquainted with some of whom were dead some settled abroad and some lost to sight in the vistas of uncertain fate catherine took very little part in the conversation but she listened intently her colourless eyes were for once bright and she watched the face of santoris as one might watch an animated picture presently dr brayle and mr swinton who had been pacing the deck together and smoking paused near the saloon door mr harland beckoned them in come in come in he said santoris this is my physician dr brayle who has undertaken to look after me during this trip santoris bowed and this is my secretary mr swinton whom i sent over to your yacht just now again santoris bowed his slight yet perfectly courteous salutation was in marked contrast with the careless modern nod or jerk of the head by which the other men barely acknowledged their introduction to him he was afraid of his life to go to you continued mr harland with a laugh he thought you might be an illusion or even the devil himself with those fiery sails mr swinton looked sheepish santoris smiled this fair dreamer of dreams here he singled me out for notice is the only one of us who has not expressed either surprise or fear at the sight of your vessel or the possible knowledge of yourself though there was one little incident connected with the pretty bunch of bell heather she is wearing why you wear the same flower yourself there was a moment's silence everyone stared the blood burned in my veins i felt my face crimsoning yet i knew not why i should be embarrassed or at a loss for words santoris came to my relief there's nothing remarkable in that is there he queried lightly bell heather is quite common in this part of the world i shouldn't like to try and count up the number of tourists i've lately seen wearing it ah but you don't know the interest attaching to this particular specimen persisted mr harland it was given to our little friend by a wild highland fellow presumably a native of mull the very morning after she had seen your yacht for the first time and he told her that on the previous night he had brought all of the same kind he could gather to you surely you see the connection santoris shook his head i'm afraid i don't he said smilingly did the wild highland fellow name me no i believe he called you the gentleman that owns the yacht oh well and santoris laughed there are so many gentlemen that own yachts he may have got mixed in his customers in any case i am glad to have some little thing in common with your friend if only a bunch of heather her bunch behaves very curiously put in catherine it never fades santoris made no comment it seemed as if he had not heard or did not wish to hear he changed the conversation much to my comfort and for the rest of the time he stayed with us rather avoided speaking to me though once or twice i met his eyes fixed earnestly upon me the talk drifted in a desultory manner round various ordinary topics and i moving a little aside took a seat near the window 
where I could watch the moon rays striking a steel-like glitter on the still waters of Loch Scavig, and at the same time hear all that was being said without taking any part in it. I did not wish to speak. The uplifted joy of my soul was too intense for anything but silence. I could not tell why I was so happy. I only knew by inward instinct that some point in my life had been reached, toward which I had striven for a far longer period than I myself was aware of. There was nothing for me now but to wait with faith and patience for the next step forward, a step which I felt would not be taken alone. And I listened with interest while Mr. Harland put his former college friend through a kind of inquisitorial examination as to what he had been doing and where he had been journeying since they last met. Santoris seemed not at all unwilling to be catechized. When I escaped from Oxford, he said, but here Mr. Harland interposed. Escaped? he exclaimed. You talk as if you had been kept in prison. So I was, Santoris replied. Oxford is a prison to all who want to feed on something more than the dry bones of learning. While there, I was like the prodigal son, exiled from my father's house. And I did eat the husks that the swine did eat. Many fellows have to do the same. Sometimes, though not often, a man arrives with a constitution unsuited to husks. Mine was, and is, such an one. You secured honors with the husks said Mr. Harland. Santoris gave a gesture of airy contempt. Honours! Such honours! Any fellow unaddicted to drinking, with a fair amount of determined plod, could win them. The alleged difficulties in the way are perfectly childish. They scarcely deserve to be called the pothooks and hangers of an education. I always got my work done in two or three hours. The rest of my time at college was pure leisure which I employed in other and wiser forms of study than those of the general curriculum, as you know. You mean occult mysteries and things of that sort? Occult is a word of such new coinage that it is not found in many dictionaries, said Santoris, with a mirthful look. You will not find it, for instance, in the earlier editions of Stormont's reliable compendium. I do not care for it myself. I prefer to say spiritual science. You believe in that? asked Catherine abruptly. Assuredly. How can I do otherwise, seeing that it is the key to the soul of nature? That's too deep for me, said Dr. Brayle, pouring himself out a glass of whiskey and mixing it with soda water. If it's a riddle, I give up. Santoris was silent. There was a moment's pause. Then Catherine leaned forward across the table, looking at him with tired, questioning eyes. "'Could you not explain?' she murmured. "'Easily,' he answered. "'Anyone can understand it with a little attention. What I mean is this. You know that the human body outwardly expresses its inward condition of health, mentality, and spirituality. Well, in exactly the same way nature— in her countless varying presentations of beauty and wisdom, expresses the soul of herself, or the spiritual force which supports her existence. Spiritual science is the knowledge, not of the outward effect, so much as of the inward cause, which makes the effect manifest. It is a knowledge which can be applied to the individual daily uses of life. The more it is studied, the more reward it bestows and the smallest portion of it thoroughly mastered, is bound to lead to some discovery, simple or complex, which lifts the immortal part of a man a step higher on the way it should go. "'You are satisfied with your researches, then?' asked Mr. Harland. Santoris smiled gravely. "'Do I look like a man that has failed?' he answered. Mr. Harland studied his handsome face and figure with ill-concealed envy. "'You went abroad from Oxford?' he queried. "'Yes. I went back to the old home in Egypt, the house where I was born and bred. It had been well kept and cared for, 
by the faithful servant to whom my father had entrusted it as well kept as a royal chamber in the pyramids with the funeral offerings untouched and a perpetual lamp burning it was the best of all possible places in which to continue my particular line of work without interruption and i have stayed there most of the time only coming away as now when necessary for a change and a look at the world as the world lives in these days and here mr harland hesitated then went on are you married santoris lifted his eyes and regarded his former college acquaintance fixedly that question is unnecessary he said you know i am not there was a brief awkward pause dr brayle looked up with a satirical smile spiritual science has probably taught you to beware of the fair sex he said i do not entirely understand you answered santoris coldly but if you mean that i am not a lover of women in the plural you are right perhaps of the one woman the one rare pearl in the deep sea hinted dr brayle unabashed come you are getting too personal brayle interrupted mr harland quickly and with asperity santoris your health he raised a glass of wine to his lips santoris did the same and this simple courtesy between the two principals in the conversation had the effect of putting their subordinate in his proper place it seems superfluous to wish health to mr santoris said catherine then he evidently has it in perfection santoris looked at her with kindly interest health is a law miss harland he said it is our own fault if we trespass against it ah you say that because you are well and strong she answered in a plaintive tone but if you were afflicted and suffering you would take a different view of illness he smiled somewhat compassionately i think not he said if i were afflicted and suffering as you say i should know that by my own neglect thoughtlessness carelessness or selfishness i had injured my organization mentally and physically and that therefore the penalty demanded was just and reasonable surely you do not maintain that a man is responsible for his own ailments said mr harland that would be too far-fetched even for you why as a matter of fact a wretched human being is not only cursed with his own poisoned blood but with the poisoned blood of his forefathers and according to the latest medical science the very air and water swarm with germs of death for the unsuspecting victim or germs of life said santoris quietly according to my knowledge or a theory as you prefer to call it there are no germs of actual death there are germs which disintegrate effete forms of matter merely to allow the forces of life to rebuild them again and these may propagate in the human system if it so happens that the human system is prepared to receive them their devastating process is called disease but they never begin their work till the being they attack has either wasted a vital opportunity or neglected a vital necessity far more numerous are the beneficial germs of revivifying and creative power and if these find place they are bound to conquer those whose agency is destructive it all depends on the soil and pasture you offer them evil thoughts make evil blood and in evil blood disease germinates and flourishes pure thoughts make pure blood and rebuild the cells of health and vitality i grant you there is such a thing as inherited disease but this could be prevented in a great measure by making the marriage of diseased persons a criminal offence while much of it could be driven out by proper care in childhood unfortunately the proper care is seldom given what would you call proper care asked catherine entire absence of self-indulgence to begin with he answered no child should be permitted to have its own way or expect to have it the first great lesson of life should be renunciation of self a faint colour crept into catherine's faded cheeks mr harland fidgeted in his chair unless a man looks after himself 
No one else will look after him, he said. Reasonable care of oneself is unselfishness, replied Santoris. But anything in excess of reasonable care is pure vice. A man should work for his livelihood chiefly in order not to become a burden on others. In the same way, he should take care of his health so that he may avoid being a troublesome invalid, dependent on others' compassion. To be ill is to acknowledge neglect of existing laws and incapacity of resistance to evil. "'You lay down a very hard and fast rule, Mr. Santoris,' said Dr. Braille. "'Many unfortunate people are ill through no fault of their own. "'Pardon me for my dogmatism when I say such a thing is impossible,' answered Santoris. If a human being starts his life in health, he cannot be ill unless through some fault of his own. It may be a moral or a physical fault, but the trespass against the law has been made. And suppose him to be born with some inherited trouble. He can eliminate even that from his blood if he so determines. Man was not meant to be sickly, but strong. He is not intended to dwell on this earth as a servant, but as a master and all the elements of strength and individual sovereignty are contained in nature for his use and advantage, if he will but accept them as frankly as they are offered ungrudgingly. I cannot grant you, and he smiled, even the smallest amount of voluntary or intended mischief in the divine plan. At that moment, Captain Derrick looked in at the saloon door, to remind us that the boat was still waiting to take our visitor back to his own yacht. He rose at once with a brief courteous apology for having stayed so long, and we all went with him to see him off. It was arranged that we were to join him on board his vessel next day, and either take a sail with him along the island coast, or else do the excursion on foot to Loch Korisk, which was a point not to be missed. As we walked all together along the moonlit deck, a chance moment placed him by my side while the others were moving on ahead. I felt rather than saw his eyes upon me and looked up swiftly in obedience to his compelling glance. There was a light of eloquent meaning in the expression of his face, but he spoke in perfectly conventional tones. I am glad to have met you at last, he said quietly. I have known you by name and in the spirit, a long time. I did not answer. My heart was beating rapidly with an excitation of nameless joy and fear commingled. Tomorrow, he went on, we shall be able to talk together, I hope. I feel that there are many things in which we are mutually interested. Still, I could not speak. Sometimes it happens, he continued, in a voice that trembled a little, that two people who are not immediately conscious of having met before feel on first introduction to each other as if they were quite old friends. Is it not so? I murmured a scarcely audible assent. He bent his head and looked at me searchingly. A smile was on his lips, and his eyes were full of tenderness. Till tomorrow is not so long to wait, he said. Not long, after so many years. Good night. A sense of calm and sweet assurance swept over me. Good night, I answered, with a smile of happy response to his own. Till tomorrow. We were close to the gangway where the others already stood. In another couple of minutes, he had made his adieu to our whole party and was on his way back to his own vessel. The boat in which he sat rowed strongly by our men soon disappeared like a black blot on the general darkness of the water. Yet we remained for some time watching, as though we could see it even when it was no longer visible. "'A strange fellow,' said Dr. Braille, when we moved away at last, flinging the end of his cigar over the yacht side. "'Something of madness and genius combined.' Mr. Harland turned quickly upon him. "'You mistake,' he answered. There's no madness, though there is certainly genius. He's of the same mind as he was when I knew him at college. There never was a saner or more brilliant scholar. It's curious you should meet him again like this, said Catherine. 
but surely father he's not as old as you are he's about three and a half years younger that's all dr brayle laughed i don't believe it for a moment he said i think he's playing a part he's probably not the man you knew at oxford at all we were then going to our cabins for the night and mr harland paused as these words were said and faced us he is the man he said emphatically i had my doubts of him at first but i was wrong as for playing a part that would be impossible to him he is absolutely truthful almost to the verge of cruelty a curious expression came into his eyes as of hidden fear in one way i am glad to have met him again in another i am sorry for he is a disturber of the comfortable peace of conventions you here he regarded me suddenly as if he had almost forgotten my presence will like him you have many ideas in common and will be sure to get on well together as for me i am his direct opposite the two poles are not wider apart than we are in our feelings sentiments and beliefs he paused seeming to be troubled by the passing cloud of some painful thought then he went on there is one thing i should perhaps explain especially to you braille to save useless argument it is of course a craze but craze or not he is absolutely immovable on one point which he calls the great fact of life that there is and can be no death that life is eternal and therefore in all its forms indestructible does he consider himself immune from the common lot of mortals asked dr brayle with a touch of derision he denies the common lot altogether replied mr harland for him each individual life is a perpetual succession of progressive changes and he holds that a change is never and can never be made till the person concerned has prepared the next costume or mortal presentment of a mortal being according to voluntary choice and liking then he is mad exclaimed catherine he must be mad i smiled then i am mad too i said for i believe as he does may i say good night and with that i left them glad to be alone with myself and my heart's secret rapture end of chapter six